So you want to be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up, guys? And welcome to another episode of the Invest Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and I'm joined today by Jesse Fergali. Jesse is a commercial real estate broker and investor. As an investor, Jesse specializes in multifamily acquisitions. As a broker in both office leasing and investment sales transactions, he's also the host of Working Capital, the Real Estate Podcast. Jesse, welcome to the show. Hey, John, how's it going? Doing well. Happy to have you. Um, you're up in uh, Toronto. Uh, we were just talking offline. Um, had a few Canadian guests, which is always a treat uh, to get kind of a different perspective on the U.S. market from uh, from outside. Um, before we get into that, um, kind of give us the Reader's Digest version, you know, what you're doing before this and, and how you got into real estate. Yeah, no problem. First of all, I want to say I, I didn't put the two and two together from Johnny Katani. That is an amazing name. <laughs> Thank I, you. I was like, Jonathan Katani, Johnny Katani. Um, yeah, man. Uh, well, first of all, I appreciate you having me on. Um, I guess, you know, I give you, like you said, um, just a condensed version of how I got into the industry. Uh, like you mentioned before, I work as an investor and, uh, and a broker or commercial realtor uh, up in Toronto. Um, the way I initially got into the industry was I started investing in 07, 08 uh, when I was in my second year uh, in college, um, for first to second year. And it was basically student rental properties. I was uh, playing football uh, at a school uh, called Laurier, uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. It's uh, in Waterloo. It's kind of like our Silicon light uh, area where there's a lot of startups, a lot of uh, tech. Um, and I went to school out there and basically I was living with a couple of guys I played ball with. And one of the, one of the friends of mine, uh, his dad and him owned the property that we were renting out. It was kind of like that light bulb moment of, you know, I'm giving, I'm paying a buddy of mine and he owns the property. And that's kind of the first foray I saw into rental properties, uh, from a student rental perspective. Um, my father, uh, entrepreneurial guy, he's a, you know, him and his brothers had an automotive shop, uh, and he really good friend of the family. Uh, one of my dad's friends had a number of rental properties. I think something like 30, 30 something single family rental properties. So I basically picked his brain at that time when I saw that my buddy was renting this place out and from there just, uh, started looking for, uh, for properties. And at that time you, you know, you have all the energy in the world, but you don't have the money. And I always, anytime I tell the story, you know, you hear online, people are like, I bought this, I bought that. And you're like, yeah, you were 14 and you did this. But you know, the reality is it, people have to get the financing from somewhere. And I basically went to my dad with a business plan. I said, you know, this is how much it's going to make. This is a great property. He summarily dismissed that and said, uh, you know, he's encouraging, but he said, absolutely not. So I, my parents were divorced. So first thing I did was go to my mom, be like, ma. Dad said no. So basically what, what I needed at that time, I had, it was a $250,000 uh, asset. It was a five bedroom. I think it was a 10% down or 10 or, yeah, I think it was 10% down at the time. And I had enough for half of it. And then what I needed was somebody to guarantee to sign on a loan to come, come up with the rest. And that's where I got the magic signature from my mom. And that's initially how I got into it. And then from there, you know, the rest is history to a certain extent. I started to acquire other properties, specifically student rental in that area. And then I got to the point where, you know, I had five or six student rentals, finished university. So came back to Toronto, tried to manage them at a distance, hour and a half. I always say anything over an hour, you might as well be in the next state or next province because, you know, you're not going to go over uh, there for a bunch of, you know, work if you're actively managing it. Um, so from there, I sold a, a number of the properties and started acquiring properties in Toronto and, you know, kind of takes us up to where I'm at today and how we've kind of moved into, uh, the multi-res space and, you know, happy to, happy to jump into any of that. Awesome. I love it. That's uh, that's a cool story. I love the dad said no. <laughs> yeah, that was, you know, it, it's, it's funny though, too, because 
the next one I did, it was kind of a proof of concept, right? Because you can kind of go to whoever it is. It doesn't, you know, if you have family, friends, whatever way that you get in the door, or if you're at the point now where you're, you know, you have a number of properties, you still have the lenders that you're trying to satisfy. And once you have one, you have that proof of concept that you can actually show that the other banks, in my case, my father, um, but whoever it is, it's basically kind of showing that, you know, you had a plan, you executed it and completed it. So yeah, it was a, it was a good uh, learning lesson. And yeah, that was kind of, uh, that was the kind of start of it. And I always say like zero to one is really the tough part in anything you do and getting that first one, realizing it's possible and then, you know, rinse and repeat. Absolutely. Yeah. The, what do they call it? The art of the first deal or, or whatever it is, because it's just like all of a sudden just goes, um, because typically you do have, you know, especially in a close network, especially now social media, you have people kind of watching and being like, Oh, I wonder what's going to happen. And then you're successful. And they're like, Hey, I want to get in on this. So, hmm. um, but you got to do that first deal and kind of, and kind of prove that, that you can do it. So, um, this was in Canada. Did, did Oh, wait, hit Canada the way that it affected the U S in, in terms of housing? Um, we were actually, we weathered it quite a bit better. A uh, part of that is, you know, if you look at like the economic history of, of even the, the depression, uh, from the U S and Canada, basically the, the banking laws, at least as far as I know, and this is something I've kind of like been a nerd about for, for a long time. And it, part of it was branch banking. You know, we have branch banking in Canada, so we, our risks are diffuse. So it, we kind of spread the risk over multiple different areas, but we have five major banks, but with multiple branches. So if one bank, you know, one branch has, has an issue, the system, you don't have that systemic risk. That being said, we still had a recession, uh, and it was still a very good opportunity for real estate and, and detrimental to, to businesses. And I think as, as you know, in the States, the real challenge at that time was credit dried up uh, and you had, you know, companies on main street, not able to get credit. So, you know, it's very interesting time now that we're kind of coming out of the last year or two, um, with, with a very different type of recession. Um, but yeah, it should, it'd be interesting to see how, how things unfold. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's good perspective. So, um, you're a broker in, um, in office space, uh, talk about what that, has been like coming out of COVID? Are you, are you guys headed back to the office and, and um, that kind of stuff? Yeah. So I, I always tell like younger individuals now that, you know, you're seeing like the next crew of brokers come in their early twenties, mid twenties. Uh, I always tell them that uh, office leasing or industrial leasing or multi-res leasing to, to that extent and retail is a great way to learn the business because at the end of the day, the value of all of our properties is predicated on a lease. That that's just the kind of the easy version of understanding valuations, right? The covenant of the tenants. So for us, um, working with different companies is really, uh, it's a treat because I can see various industries do my job and my job repeats. So whether, you know, you're a tech startup, in software and then you're dealing with a law firm. So you see a lot of different type of uh, companies, which is, you know, from my perspective, I think a lot of people in our industry are similar to me or I'm similar to them in that, uh, you know, I, I, if I did one thing every day, I'd probably lose it. So the fact that there's this like creativity, I think investors understand that too. Uh, they like, you know, different projects. Um, to your question about how it's uh, been impacted, without a doubt, Office was impacted by COVID. I think you know, taking the four major food groups of real estate, industrial, multi-res, retail, and office, uh, you know, industrial, I think most people know was on fire, continued to be on fire with COVID. Uh, multi-res also a very, very popular asset class. Retail, if it was grocery store anchored, uh, if it was essential services, um, I always say if there was like Mike's Taekwondo and Jenny's Nails, those places didn't do as good, that kind of tertiary stuff. Um, Long story short, you get to office. Office was in this kind of weird space because we're shut down in a lot of areas uh, in North America and people are wondering what's going to happen uh, and what they're going to do with their office. I think now that we're, the dust is settled to a certain extent, the takeaways were that office is an important part of most businesses in terms of how they build culture, how they build um, their, their teams. Uh, I think leadership has acknowledged that. But also, in the same breath, we acknowledge the fact that you can have hybrid work models without 
uh, the business suffering. And we, we've learned certain businesses actually are really, um, the makeup of the business is really set up well for that type of, uh, that type of environment and some not so much. So I'm very bullish on the office. Obviously I'm biased, but we've seen a huge uptick since the beginning of this year, 2022 to now, uh, versus last year. It's, you know, it's tremendous how many companies, even if it's just to come out and say like, what's going on, because leaders in, in these companies, they want to make sure that they're ahead of the curve. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. And there are certainly, uh, some businesses, like you mentioned, like collaborative business, like you think of like law firms, uh, CPA firms, you know, certain businesses like, you know, tech doesn't really require you to be in the office. Certainly the collaboration piece of it is, you know, useful, but you can have a smaller office, you know, downsize, but there are certainly some business models that really do need that, that office space in order to, to be successful. Yeah. So have you seen a change in the, the target businesses you're going for in terms of leasing? I. Uh to a certain extent, like for us, we do, I'd say 30% of what we do on the brokerage side is listing work. So our clients are these larger uh, landlords, um, well, private and larger. So pension funds, real estate investment trusts, and then private. And then the balance of that is tenant rep. So then, you know, we're dealing with companies and, you know, part of it in our world is where somebody is in their, their lease cycle, whether it's five, 10 year deals. And you find, you know, in terms of BD, if, you, if they're not already a client, uh, it's about finding them in, you know, a good spot in their lease or being able to say like, okay, you're coming up to an expiry, you know, have you thought about it? Uh, the one good positive thing I think for tenants in our market, we're very similar to LA and New York uh, prior to COVID in that office vacancy was like 2%, 2.7%, ridiculously low to the point where tenants had no uh, negotiating power, where now we're starting to see a little bit more of a balanced market. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of what we're working on now. And then, you know, on my partners on the other side, uh, you know, we're continuing, continuing to look for, uh, acquisitions on the investment side. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. That makes, that makes perfect sense, especially right, right in the heart of the city like that. So you mentioned that you also invest in the U S um, what is your investment thesis for, for U S investing and what is it like investing, you know, from from Canada, essentially, like what other red tape or hurdles that, that you have as a foreign investor, I guess, so to speak. Yeah. I was going to say, I, when I say invest in the U S I have bought my first property in the U S so I'm definitely not an authority, but, uh, it was, um, it was something that was kind of on my 2022, uh, you know, new year's resolution, whatever you want to call it in that, um, you know, buy, buy an asset in, uh, in the States. And what happened was I had a buddy of mine that actually does residential real estate up here and he, uh, basically had a sister company that works in, in Florida and they do a bunch of, uh, condos, townhouses, single family homes in, uh, Orlando, Miami, some in Fort Lauderdale. So basically got, uh, got him to look at this one pre construction. It was a townhouse in Orlando. I was thinking of doing the short-term rental, uh, aspect of it in Miami. I decided to, to go with this. It seemed like a better investment. Um, so in terms of the actual hurdles, I think it's important that when you're looking, if whether you're in Canada investing in the States or you're in the States investing in Canada, I think what's important is that number one, the structure of, of how you invest. So talking to a CPA, talking to a lawyer, it's a little bit of money and cash out first, really, if you want to get good advice, because any investor knows that basically any CPAs or lawyers, they don't give free advice very often and you want to get good advice. And I'll just give an example. A lot of Canadians, they listen to these late night infomercials about investing in the U S and they say, put it in an LLC. And you know, that's the structure you should use. And we don't have that in Canada. We don't have an equivalent to the LLC. Well, we have something similar, but there's no LLC. So there's no limited liability company. So what happens is Canadians go to the States, they put an investment in an LLC and the Canadian government says, Nope, that's a corporation. And now they're subject to double taxation. So, just stuff like that of understanding how to invest when you're buying properties down there is one of like the first steps. Uh, we have a number of very solid uh, tax treaties between um, the U.S. and Canada. So 
one of the other piece to keep in mind is withholding tax so that when you're getting rental income, acknowledge or you have to understand that the IRS will have uh, withholding tax, which can be ameliorated if you fill out the right forms and you can get it taxed on the net instead of gross, because any investor knows that if you're getting 30% tax on your gross income, like a lot of investors, right? After you depreciate, there's no, there's no 30% of gross income. So it's little things like that. I think the, the other really big one is understanding the debt side of things. A U.S. Um, individual that's domiciled in the, in the States for tax is going to have a hard time getting a mortgage in Canada and vice versa. So for me, the IRS doesn't know me. They, they don't know, they don't have an identity for, for me. So for me to get credit, I have to build credit in the U S so as the first investment, the mortgage is going to come from Canada. And one of the things you can do to try to bridge the gap. And if you really want to start building credit in another country is you, you first of all, utilize a bank that does cross border. Uh, you know, that has locations in both the States and Canada. So for me, CIBC or TD North, that kind of thing where we can have both. And Florida is great for that. A lot of Canadians live in Florida. Uh, and then I think lastly, uh, sorry for the long winded answer. I was, we were just talking about this in the office, but lastly, I think it's like understanding your strategy. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, if you're in a certain place in Arkansas, maybe short-term rentals isn't, isn't the way to go. If you're in Miami. Okay. Uh, understanding the, what type of strategy you, you want to actually employ. Is it burr? Is it wholesaling and, and making sure that the geography you pick is conducive to that. So yeah, that's high level. What I'd, I'd say there. Interesting. Okay. Wow. Uh, a lot of fascinating things that I'm learning for the first time. Uh, one I want to touch on is this LLC. So do you only have one structure that you're allowed to create in, in Canada? No. So, what happens in Canada, like, so our corporation, there's one type of corporation, it would be most similar to your C corps. I know you have S corps and C corps in the States. Um, the limited liability company, you know, for any listeners that don't know, I'm, I'm sure most do that. What you're trying to do is have a pass through, right? You have ownership of something, but it's a pass through entity. We do have that, but it, we do it in the GPLP structure, general partner, limited partner. So if you and I, for instance, were the general partners and we went to buy something in the States and we had a number of different limited partners. They would be like members in an LLC if you use that context, right? So I think member, you know, member and investors is the equivalent. Um, it's just important to know that, you know, you start using a structure in a country that your country doesn't recognize there's implications for that. And a lot of times where, when you're in investing, you know, it's so good to get a tax lawyer because if you talk to an accountant, mo you know, it's a blanket uh, term, but I think it's it's true. Most of the time, accountants are trying to protect you from a tax perspective, and lawyers are thinking liability. So you might get a lawyer that says, "Don't put it in personal in your personal name." You might have an accountant that says, "No, the personal name's fine. Just get you know more insurance or vice versa." So just getting the right information, um, I think, is really helpful. And I actually had uh, there's a I think she's a Floridian by I think she's from Florida, but she worked up here. It's Lauren. Cohen, if you just type that and type in cross border and Google, she's got a lot of good information. I have, I've had her on my podcast about if you're investing in Canada or if you're investing in the States. Interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, you know, obviously the, the connections that we have, of course, sharing a border, you know, there's a lot of things I would imagine that they want to make it as simple as possible to a certain extent. I know that there's this underlying thing that Canadians don't like Americans. Americans don't like Canadians, but I've never had any problems. Hey, man, so. I love, I love Americans. Uh, like a lot of my family, when they immigrated, uh, they are went in through Ellis Island. So in New York and in New Jersey. So I love the States. Um, it was a blast being there over COVID to get away from the lockdowns here. So they let you leave, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I got out of here. Um, you know, in certain windows, we went into harder lockdown, semi hard, and yeah, so it was nice being able to travel. One last thing I would say I uh, forgot to mention is one of the best things you can do is find a partner in the States or in Canada, because then you can kind of do the real estate thing of, you know, if I'm going to be the operational guy or gal, and you're going to be the one that guarantees the debt, then all of a sudden, you know, if, if you're 50, 50 on a property and you go to a U.S. bank, the bank's like, okay, we don't really know this guy, but we know this person. So 
you know, it opens the door for a little bit more ease of transaction. Uh, and it's also great, you know, you make connections in a new city, uh, in a new state. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and while you were explaining it, I was kind of thinking in my head, I was like, okay, if I want to do this, I would probably just partner with someone who is already up there and gets it. And, and so that makes perfect sense. So along those lines, what is the market like up there? Do you guys have rent controls across everything? You know, um, what does that look like in terms of rental increases and, and different aspects of, of the business? Yeah, we have, uh, it is a, it's a shock for most people when they're investing in the States and then come to Canada because we have rent control, which, you know, the fancy term for rent control these days is rent stabilization. I, I did a podcast with, uh, with this gentleman, Richard Epstein, uh, who's fantastic. He's like, he's a lawyer at, at, uh, NYU and kind of gave a history of rent control and, Rent stabilization is basically rent control with an allowable percentage you're allowed to raise it every year. And the percentage is, is very low. Like it's kind of, well, I was going to say goes with inflation, but inflation is pretty high right now. It was like 1.8% last year. So Jeez. yeah. So the other thing is what, what we have is rent decontrol. It's a lot of like confusing terms, but what that means is that when somebody moves out, I can mark to market the rent. So if you're paying 500 and it's really worth a thousand, once you move out, I can charge you a thousand. But as you can imagine, just like in New York, what do people do? They don't leave. So you're really stuck. And in Canada, it's not like, you know, like picture Texas, uh, you're, you're done. You're, you're in Dallas, you're done. Your lease, your landlord's like, I want you out. That's, you know, that's the breaks that landlord wants you out. Canada, you cannot evict somebody. What happens at the end of a fixed rate, uh, sorry, a fixed term tenancy is that it reverts to a month to month and you can't kick somebody out with like to, there's only a, a few circumstances. If you're moving in personally, which you have to live there for at least the guidance is a year, you can be fined $25,000. If you're doing substantial renovations, but even if you do that, you have to give the property back to them after the renovations. So what happens in our market is I'm going to call them incentives. People pay tenants to leave. And in Toronto, the going rate for buying tenants out, it can vary from anything from 15,000 to $50,000, basically just to say, you know, can you leave and agree to sign this? And I, I don't know one landlord that likes doing that. I don't, and obviously there is a meeting of the minds for two people to agree to that. And there's a lot of people in the press here that say, you know, it's taken advantage of tenants. I disagree with that, but I'm a biased landlord. And I think when you hand somebody $25,000 and they accept it, um, you know, I get that there's a power imbalance, but that's kind of what happens in our market. Um, but what I tell my American friends is I say like that, it's not necessarily a bad thing with any challenge in a market is going to create some opportunity. So somebody that can, you know, have a protocol for this market, just like there are successful investors in, in Maryland, in New Jersey, uh, Washington, where there are different versions of rent control. Um, so I think for us, it's just a matter of, yeah, it's, it's a little bit more challenging in that sense. And I'll say this, this is where student rentals to me are very interesting because you don't have to force kids to leave, you know, after three years, they're like, see you later. Like, it's very rare that you get somebody that's you know going to, uh, going to school and then stays there. So you can mark to market the rents every three years. You just have to deal with maybe a little bit more on the maintenance side. Interesting. Yeah. That's a very awesome perspective and a, a good kind of find there as well as, you know, anything like if you were close to a hospital, maybe like traveling nurses or something too. I'm not sure if traveling nursing yeah. is a thing in Canada. Well, that's, it, um, that's like, uh, so the Orlando property that I bought was right be beside the name escapes me, but it's a, it's a massive, uh, it's a massive hospital. And it's kind of the same idea where you have nurses that if you have shorter term rentals, you can utilize that. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. So, and, um, that was a really great point that you made where the opportunities are there. You just have to be willing to do them. So does that keep, uh, I guess like, uh, less, uh, less investors, less, um, people trying to get on deals because of these sort of hurdles that you have to deal with, or is it still a lot no, of people? The, the problem is like, yeah, we still have the it, Canada, like, like the States, I think in general, we are extremely supply constrained, uh, despite what people say like, Oh, real estate prices. Like it's, it's not a supply issue. It is 100% a supply issue. We have the majority of the, of the multifamily rental stock in Canada is 
is extremely old, like circa 70s and, and older. It, so what we what's happened in our major cities, whether it's Vancouver, Ottawa, Montreal, is the condo development market has basically picking up uh, the slack for the multi-res uh, and, multi and single family. So what is created, is, you'll hear the term a shadow, a shadow market. And it's basically condos like you and I owning a condo and renting the condo out rather than some developer building a large uh, purpose-built development. And that is kind of the concern because investors, at least there's been legislation where 2016 or 2017, where there isn't rent control for buildings built after that. But I think a lot of investors, they're, they're weary of building a lot of these projects because they don't know if the government's going to say that you can or can't raise rent. So bottom line is that we don't get enough of this type of property built. And I think the other piece is a regulatory environment. It's very similar to California where you know, you can, you can uh, fix the issue if you just loosen some of the regulations where you have the ability to kind of rezone uh, this idea of nimbyism that, you know, you can't build in my area or banana. I don't know if you've heard that, the new no, one. No, that one? It's build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> so it's like, you can't have it both ways. If you're left of center politically and you're like, no, there's, we have to have all this regulation, then you can't be that person that's chewing kale in, in your town. And then, you know, a lower income uh, individual wants to live in there. And you're like, ah, next town over. Like yeah. we, we need to democratize, I think to a certain extent um, where you can build and what you can build. And I'll get off my soapbox right there. Thanks so much for coming to the TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> I was just having this conversation about affordable housing here in the States and how the uh, President Biden administration is trying to roll out all these things, but they're getting in their own way. They're like, yeah, we want to make more affordable housing, but it's going to take you two years probably before, you know, you can turn a property into affordable. And you're like, okay, well then why would I even do it? Yeah. Yeah. You guys have a, uh, <laughs> you guys have some interesting things happening right now, even with energy, like you, you know, you're a lot of these policies, even with the Fed, where like the top of the agenda is is systemic risks uh, for climate change. Um, and it's like they, you're talking to the Fed. They're like inflation should be the thing you're talking about with them. Like not to say that's not important, but it's like, you know, pick pick your lane in terms of uh, in, ter in terms of who you're talking to. But you know, at the end of the day, I th still think it's such a great country to invest in. And, and whether you're in Canada or the States, we are spoiled in terms of the the tax framework uh as you know most of your list, listeners will know that you guys especially and now i think you guys do you still have um the uh bonus depreciation that you can take on properties yeah so yeah we'll have it for a while actually but it's going to start going down by 20 percent. so this is the last mm -hmm. year of 100 percent. next year's 80 60 so on and so forth um rumors that that could change um for sure but so you yeah. do not have that in Canada. We have the depreciation, but bonus, not exactly like that. Um, the other thing is, I think we can do it similarly, but for you know those that in the States use cost segregation or cost seg, where you can kind of itemize your, your depreciation schedules. Um, I think that's something that you have and we don't. Um, don't quote me on that one. Um, but I think the other main, one of the big main differences with your market as opposed to ours is we don't have 1031 exchanges. There's no such thing as that. So we are a very buy and hold um, type of market. Not, not completely, but that is a large part of what happens. Whereas, you know, if somebody told me, okay, you can buy a like and kind asset, uh, roll it into this one, you know, we would probably have more velocity in our market. But for us, you know, clients say like, you know, well, if I sell this, I'm going to, I'm going to pay a bunch of taxes. It's like, well, yeah, yeah. You did make all that money though. So that's, but yeah, we don't have the ability to kind of, uh, to roll things over into other properties. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So definitely, definitely some differences there. There are certainly a lot of, and I've done episodes on this with lawyers and CPAs. We have a lot of incentives, hmm. um, for real estate, because ultimately you're dealing with, you know, a, a need, an essential need for, for humans, which is, you know, a place to live. Um, so, so yeah, makes a lot of sense. Awesome. Well, as we wind up here, um, I've got five questions to ask all of my guests. Uh, it's the final five. Um, so we'll get to that. Uh, what's the best advice you've gotten from a mentor? 
the best advice that I've gotten from a mentor, I'm thinking of something recently that I've had, I, you know what, I think for me, it's, um, it's cliche, but it's not having a limiting belief in terms of, of what you can do. And part of, uh, one of the, my mentors, when I was younger, it basically said, if there's something that you want to do, like go out and, and do that, um, do that thing that will kind of lead to that. So for just give an example, when I bought my first property, I had no business buying properties, but the idea of calling a realtor saying, Hey, you know, here's a, a list of houses that I want to go see as a 19 year old or 20 year old and actually going in there and kind of experiencing that. And I think, you know, it's been said before by a number of people, but once you do that process, it sounds kind of, you know, very abstract, but you're going in there, you're talking to somebody, you're seeing space, you're immersing yourself in something that was only a possibility before. And suddenly it's becoming a reality. And I think I've done that with other things in my life where if there was an opportunity to uh, get into a certain area in real estate, it's like, just go to that event or go to that in that environment, link up with people that are doing what you want to do in that environment. Um, that's always been something for me that I've gotten value out of. And it's always scary at first, especially, you know, if you're the new person in that area, but really is about kind of getting in there and, and immersing yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, and that's what holds people back so much is that starting kind of circling back to what we said, the, the art of the first deal. It's so it's so intimidating, right? Because, you know, someone's up on stage who has a billion dollars in assets, and you're like, I could never have a billion dollars in assets. But then you break it down, or even, you know, I've talked to those people, and they're like, yeah, there was a day where I had zero, right? Yeah, I started where you started. And then you start to realize those kinds of things. You're like, okay, like I can be that person too. Yeah. Um, is there a lot of education available? Like is one thing I love here in the States is this is a sector where everybody tries to help everybody. Is it, is it the same up there as well? Yeah. I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine. I think this is, you know, I assume other industries are similar, but you know, working with a number of different companies that there's definitely different uh, variations, but I found like, real estate investors want to help out other real estate investors, especially when there's an age gap. I don't know if you've noticed, but when you have somebody that's like <clears throat> in their, you know, fifties or sixties and they see a young kid in their, you know, twenties, uh, asking for help, trying to add value to them, you know, don't just go and say, you know, help me with this and that. But it, there really is, I think, a want, um, to help that person because they see some of themselves in that person, if they've been an investor. So, yeah, hundred percent. I think that it is a, it is an area that, um, where I see a lot of that. And then the other thing too, is everybody likes their ego stroked a bit. So, you know, for them, it's kind of validation that they've done well in their career and, and they're kind of, you know, handing down knowledge to like the next, uh, the, the next generation of investors. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's a great perspective for sure. Love that. Uh, what is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Uh, it's definitely the relationships. Uh, it's the fact that I'm exposed to people that are smarter than me, stronger than me, better at, you know, certain aspects of the business than me. And it, the ability to do that, I think it just makes you a better investor, probably better person in general. Um, and having those doors open to those different facets, I think is something that fulfills my why, which is, you know, to constantly be trying to grow, um, whether that's a portfolio or you interpersonally. Um, I think that's a big thing, uh, developing the relationships and continuing to do that. And who knows, maybe my next uh, cool partner is going to be in Orlando. And, you know, that's just another example of kind of ex expanding the, the network of people you have, but doing it in what I think is a meaningful way. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, it's so true how, sort of the the five people I surround myself with has changed and is more focused on, you know, we all have the same mindset, same goals. Um, and then, you know, that once that energy gets going, man, you just feeding off each other. And it's really awesome. Uh, favorite non real estate or investment related book? Um, I would say uh, basic economics by Tom soul is probably, I mean, it's it's slightly related to pretty much everything, but that is one of my favorite books on just how the, how the world works from an economic perspective. Thomas Sowell's uh, probably one of my favorite economists uh, or economist historian in general. Um, yeah, that book is, uh, yeah, it was a huge book uh, for me that, uh, that I got into when I was, uh, well, not too long ago, but yeah, that's a good one. 
Nice. Love it. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Superpower invisibility. Nice. There you go. Don't get that one too often. Slightly creepy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it depends how you use it for sure. <laughs> uh, it's like, what did they know? I could have had them at 20 mil. I could have had them at 20 mil. And then you can just go in there, hear different real estate conversations when you're, uh, <laughs> you're putting APSs in. Like go listen on a seller and be like, you know what? Yeah. They're like, yeah, you know what? We would actually take a lower price. And all of a sudden you just come in, you're like, Hey, uh, would you guys take it for this price? <laughs> You know, I said, I should have said time travel. I'm such a sci-fi fan. That, that seems like the better one, but that's why you do the, the fast five. That's right. Final five. Uh, awesome. And last one, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you and learn more? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can go to, uh, Instagram, Jesse for Galley, F R A G A L E. Um, you can pretty much type that into YouTube or Instagram. You can check things out there. If you're interested in the podcast, workingcapitalpodcast.com or Working Capital, uh, the real estate podcast, anywhere on Spotify or Apple, wherever you watch your stuff. Um, we interview, you know, not dissimilar to you. We interview people that are investing in uh, real estate, but also, you know, professionals that surround our, our um, industry. So CPAs, lawyers, et cetera. Awesome. I love it. Jesse, thank you so much for all of your, uh, Inside and perspective, I had a lot of fun. Johnny Katani, thanks, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Uh, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe, it helps a ton. Leave comments, we'd love to know what you guys think and uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.